Uh, welcome you all to SNU Medicine webinar on medical education during COVID-19. My name is Q An Lee and I am the Associate Dean for International Affairs and will moderate the webinar today. Uh, today's webinar uh, is very unique and timely as it deals with the topic of medical education during COVID-19 and I hope uh, we can share each other's experiences exchange ideas and set a common ground to better cope with this unprecedented medical education situation. Uh, this webinar will last about two hours briefly after a welcome speech by Dean Shin of Seoul National University, minute discussion time, and then we'll follow with four participants presentation and after all the presentations, we will have discussion session again. I would like to remind you that today's webinar will be live streamed on YouTube and Facebook. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to leave comments. So we can bring up your questions and comments during the discussion time. Also, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that recorded version of this webinar will be uploaded to our homepage, YouTube, and Facebook. I'm pleased to introduce Dean Dr. Chan Su Shin, who is the host of this webinar, to deliver his welcome remarks. Please, Dr. Shin. <coughs> welcome. Welcome all to the webinar for medical education during COVID-19. Hi, uh, my name is Chan Su Shin. I am the Dean of SNU College of Medicine. First of all, I would like to thank all the participants, deans, and other professors who joined this special webinar. I am delighted as we are reunited once again after our very first partnership meeting, which was held last January. It has already been nearly six months since World Health Organization declared public health emergencies of international concern in January this year. Today, we know that it is at the stage of pandemic affecting more than 13 million of people around the world. I'm sure all of our institutions have already taken measures and do adapting well to this pandemic. I guess most of you have successfully transformed traditional face-to-face -face lecture to online education, although there are still issues on labs, clinical rotations, and examinations. In this webinar, we would like to share our experiences and coping strategies for these unprecedented events and also to learn each other. As was noticed, we have one plenary session and two sessions from nine uh, different institutions. Let's begin with a plenary lecture from Professor Roger Wang from University of British Columbia, Canada, who is the Executive Associate Dean for Education. Uh, it is an honor for us to have him as a plenary speaker. Uh, hi, Professor Wang, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to be with you this afternoon to talk about medical education during COVID-19. I'm going to start uh, sharing my slides. And these are very different times. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon to talk about some of the experience here at the University of British Columbia. I will be explaining to you in a few moments some of the strategies that we have taken. And I'm sure that many of us have tried new and different ways in order to optimize medical education during these unprecedented times. This is my disclosure slide. What I would like to do today is to share with you some of the principles, the principles behind the adaptations that we have taken in medical education 
during COVID-19. In particular, I would like to share with you and describe for you the opportunities in medical education innovations that arise from opportunities that are unparalleled during this pandemic. I want to start off by sharing with you that the epidemiology of COVID-19 in each of our jurisdictions can be different. This particular slide illustrates the cases in terms of what happened in the province of British Columbia, which is where I am located and speaking with you today. And in this particular chart, we have also provided the curve for the rest of Canada as a country, as well as with some other countries and jurisdictions. You can see that epidemiologically, the curve of COVID-19 in British Columbia can be described as relatively flattened, at least for now. We recognize that after the first wave, there can be the possibility of other waves, such as what has been seen around the world as advised by the World Health Organization. It is important to remember that many of the adaptations that we have taken in society, including in higher education, such as in medical education, they actually follow the epidemiologic curves that we see in each of our own jurisdiction. The province of British Columbia has a single medical school, and that is the University of British Columbia. We have a distributed medical education platform. There are four regional campuses of the UBC Medical School located in the Vancouver Fraser area, in Vancouver Island, in the north and in the interior. This is a map showing the province of British Columbia and every single dot that you can see on the map represents activity, training activity in medical education. It's important to remember that even before COVID-19 that we have already established a platform of distributed medical education, a platform which turns out to be extremely helpful and important as we make adaptations during COVID-19. What I'm trying to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, is that we try to leverage on existing infrastructure and platform and build upon them kind of the necessary adaptations in order to empower infrastructure and enhance medical education to continue during the pandemic. I think all of us make use of all these adaptations for one purpose, and that is for our students and learners. It is important to remember that the psychological impact of the pandemic of COVID-19 on our students, but as well as our faculty members and staff can be very significant. And this slide illustrates some of those impacts as described actually in the literature. If you look at the psychology literature, there clearly has been expression and description of uncertainty, fear, anxiety, and all the way leading to social isolation and loneliness, but also some education-specific impact, such as when am I going to graduate? What about the financial burden for the students? And what about infrastructural needs, basic necessities? such as housing and childcare. These are things that actually face not only our students, but also our faculty members and staff. Recognizing this is a very complex picture, I want to share with you today that there are two key enabling strategies that we have taken, that we have learned in managing and dealing with the challenges that come along with COVID-19. First, it is important to have some rapid response teams. And very early on in the pandemic, we actually have created two rapid response teams, one to make recommendations and the other one to implement the recommendations. And these are what we call the COVID-19 advisory working group, which is to make recommendations, and then a task force, which focuses on undergraduate medical education during COVID-19, which is for implementation. 
The other thing that we learned very quickly early on is the importance of effective communication. Really using multiple modal delivery for both the internal stakeholders and the external stakeholders. And I'll be describing to you some of the intersect between the medical school, University Central, our health authority partners, and the government. When you look at the recommendation making body, which is the Faculty of Medicine COVID-19 Advisory Working Group, it comprises of different units or services within the faculty. Recognizing that at UBC, the Faculty of Medicine is home to a number of health and medical education programs. In addition to the Doctor of Medicine program, in both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels, we are also home to a number of health professions programs, graduate programs, and then we have a number of supportive units that I'm going to be talking to you about. It is important that all these units work in unison in making recommendations as we adapt to COVID-19. In terms of the task force, which specifically addresses undergraduate medical education, it is a relatively large body. The composition of this task force actually has 75 members. About one fifth of them are students, and the rest of them comprise of education leadership, curriculum leads, assessment leads, student affairs, and other operational managers. It is important to remember that there are multiple purposes that are served by the task force. Clearly, the members of the task force are engaged in brainstorming, making decisions, discussing different adaptations and services, but more importantly, they also determine on information sharing. We want to make sure that despite the size of the task force, the functionality of this task force in terms of making decisions must be nimble and principle-based. Let me share with you one of the key learnings that we have found early on during COVID-19. And that is, while these decisions that are made by the task force on adapting undergraduate medical education can be very complex, they are always principle-based. And this slide illustrates these principles at priori before any decision is made. It is really important that we always talk about safety first, safety of the patient, but also safety of the students, faculty, and staff members. We also talk about continuity of learning. And this is the question for the students, when am I going to graduate? And in fact, we have to make sure that whatever decisions we made comply with governmental guidelines, both in terms of the government of Canada, as the federal government, and the government of British Columbia, as the provincial government. We also have to make sure that the principles and the decisions are aligned with university structures, as well as our health authority partners, as well as the regulatory bodies, the licensure bodies. Our curriculum is distributed, and therefore delivery at the regional medical campuses must be taken into account when we make these adaptations. In communicating any changes in policies, and other practices, we must make sure that there's a single source of information. And students actually are needed to follow any kind of regular policies and procedures that they normally would follow as part of the program. What I'm trying to say is that the governance of the program continues the way that it has always been set up. And these are really important principles because oftentimes decisions that are made are not necessarily right or wrong, good or bad. Depending on the perspectives of the stakeholders, there can be different interpretations. It is therefore very important that people can agree with the principles before they get into operation. One of the key things that I'm sure all of us have learned during COVID-19, including in medical education, is flexibility. Our curricular adaptations in the medical program are actually flexible. And these adaptations must be flexible in both the delivery and the administration. 
but they build upon the existing pedagogical design. So for example, when we actually had to make the decision to switch over to remote emergency teaching, online teaching, we did it in literally three days. I remember it was a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and bang, on Wednesday, we are fully online. And I see that some of us are already nodding. It's a very shared experience. What is interesting, though, is we learn that as we now move into the next phase of COVID-19, some of the online learning initially will need to undergo further transformation into best practices. Because things that we change very quickly early on perhaps can be improved upon subsequently. So I'll talk to you about some of the strategies that we've done in this ongoing quality improvement of the adaptations. We also modify assessment. Now this is probably something which is also very contentious amongst medical schools around the world because in our program, in the MD program, we have always adopted a programmatic assessment approach. In other words, when we switch into a COVID-19 adaptive curriculum and assessment, how do we move some of these modules? And I'm going to show you a graphic later on. It's the analogy of switching like building blocks or Lego blocks, as if we are plugging, unplugging, and replugging. So it's like a plugging and playing kind of phenomenon. Many of us have been scratching our head and when we think about how do we deliver clinical teaching, in-person teaching, because you can only teach clinical skills in medical education with online teaching up to a certain extent. The reason why we are going through this is that early on in the pandemic, we made the difficult decision mainly to protect the safety of our patients and our learners and students that clinical experiences in all years have to be placed temporarily on hold. And I recognize that this is a very similar strategy that many medical schools around the world have taken, at least in Canada, all 17 medical schools in the country have actually put temporarily on hold the clinical training experiences early on. How do we do this without delaying graduation? That is the million dollar question. And we do it by rearranging curriculum modules so that when we eventually reinstate clinical learning, we have another set of principles which we can talk about. We make sure that people can finish within the time for graduation without delay. And at the same time, the program meets curriculum and accreditation and regulatory requirements. And this is always very important. Some of the principles when we decide when to restart clinical training include, once again, safety of the patient, safety of the students, safety of the teachers, clinical capacity, what is the true learning value of their work, and also supervision that is actually available. Now you may say, with hundreds of medical students actually temporarily out of clinical activities for safety reasons, what do they end up doing? Well, at UBC, I'm tremendously proud of our medical students. A medical class size is 288 students per year. It is a four-year program. And of all those students, we have over actually 700 medical students who have gone into student-led activities of public health and other kind of support activities to support frontline physicians and healthcare workers. And you can see this particular bar chart showing the kind of activities that students have done. This is part of what we call the British Columbia Medical Student Response Team. It is a phenomenon which really illustrates the commitment and the accountability of our students to the society. It is part of that social contract. Many of us as medical educators are so proud of our students because during a public health crisis such as COVID-19, these students step up to the plate and actually take part in an active role, albeit in a safety mode, because these are not practicing physicians yet. And yet they're able to support a variety of public health and other activities 
all out of their own volition. This is an interesting picture that I think many of us have different versions of. Zoom pictures or other kind of online platform showing students from UBC, both from the medical school and from the School of Music. Because we have done and started a new initiative called Connecting with Compassion, whereby our students in UBC are connecting using computer tablet devices with older residents in nursing homes, long-term care homes, because they are socially isolated as a result of COVID-19. The music students actually do musical performances and in multiple different languages and trying to connect with the most vulnerable who are impacted as a result of COVID-19. What I'm trying to illustrate for you is that there are some unique opportunities arising from the pandemic that we actually can deploy and use as learning opportunities by supporting and empowering our students, such as in this project of connecting with compassion. Now, this is the slide that I shared with you before about building blocks or the analogy of Lego blocks. You see that when we talk about the years, the classes who are affected, the class of 2020 has already graduated. I'm very pleased to say that the usual graduation timeline of our MD program, the Doctor of Medicine program, is in the month of May. As a result of COVID-19, they are still able to graduate on time without delay. That said, we know, and I'm sure many of my colleagues around the globe today will notice that the classes in the next two years, so class of 2021 and the class of 2022, are also potentially impacted. So when we're doing the forward planning and thinking, it is not just about this year's graduating class. It's absolutely also about next year's class and my prediction, probably the year after, although none of us have a crystal ball to predict for sure, given the ever-changing and evolving epidemiology of COVID-19 around the world. Let me describe to you some of the changes we have made for our year three, just recently promoted to year four class. So for these students, the clinical culture has been temporarily interrupted with 10 weeks to go. So they have, our, our structure of our curriculum is that our year three students would have completed the bulk of the clinical classroom and training. So they are short of 12 weeks. Now we have modified the 12 to a 10 week block. And that's the last bit. And they actually have just returned clinically to the hospital and clinics exactly a week ago, July the 6th. So I'm still very much fingers crossed at this point to hope that everything is going to be okay. There is, when, when the students were off, what we did was we enrolled all of them into the FLEX course first. It's a flexible enhanced learning course on scholarship, research, and so on. And we actually changed the timing of that from end of year four to the time when they were pulled out of clinical service. In fact, at the same time, we make sure that anything that can be taught online will continue to be taught online, such as academic half day and full day. We also want to make sure that our assessment is unchanged. And that involves, remember, programmatic assessment. We actually have a lot of workplace-based assessments or direct observations. Students are still expected to complete the direct observations with the relevant midpoint evaluation, and in a rotation evaluation. What is also changing will be later on in the summer, the students would have gone into the elective blocks. In Canada, all 17 medical schools have decided that just because of COVID-19 and the difficulty with travel restrictions, that none of the medical schools will offer out of province electives. So in other words, all electives will be done locally. Now in a big medical school such as UBC, we actually provide the full spectrum of programs to our students anyways. So the impact on our students is relatively small. That said, to some of the smaller or the medium-sized medical schools, the inability, 
because of limited capacity to do out of province electives can be impactful. The next slide then talked about the year three class. These are the students who have just got promoted from second year to third year. So these students would have been just entering clinical clerkship. What we have done there is once again, we try to make sure that cohorts do not overlap too much because we do have a limited clinical capacity of how many classes of students can you take at any given time concurrently. We therefore have designed an eight week block which is through virtual and simulation instruction, what we call a bootcamp concept, which I have to say, beyond the pandemic, this might not be a bad idea to prepare the students for the clinical culture training. Culture will start in the end of August, and then we have made small adaptations in terms of the time frame for the number of weeks that are involved, and we continue to have the assessment, including multiple choice examination and ASCII examinations and so on. So very similar changes, but we are already thinking at least two classes further down the road. In the final few minutes, I want to share with you what we have done in terms of pivoting our capabilities within the medical school to supporting both our students and our teachers and our professors when we have to transition to best practice online learning. I've created a new platform, which is called the Virtual Educational Resource Hub, or abbreviated as VERB or the VERB. And this is actually pivoting resources on a Center for Health Education Scholarship, which is our medical education research unit, a faculty development unit, which is province-wide, a medical ed tech, which is IT with education technology video protection, our hack space for innovation and visualization, which is called Hive. This is emerging media, such as teaching neuroanatomy using HoloLens technology, for example. That is a very famous project that you might have seen on YouTube. And uh, leveraging on the learning resources from our medical library. So, these are some examples of things that we offer through faculty development. And these are for the teachers, for the professors. We help support them for orientation, immediate real-time post-sessional debriefing, as well as ongoing scheduled faculty development drop-in clinics. What I'm trying to say is that for our professors, transition to best practice online learning is not intuitive for everybody. So we want to support them and providing extra training and resources. In terms of education scholarship innovations, already in the last few months, we have a good number of consultations that has been approached by um, our unit to supporting associate deans, assistant deans, medical residents, and students in coming up with the education research basis of a lot of these adaptations. Another very cool innovation is so-called the water cooler discussion. As professors and faculty and staff are working remotely, many working from their home, they miss that opportunity of interaction, person-to-person -person interaction right around the pantry or the lunchroom or the water cooler. And obviously, that would require physical distancing. So what we have done is to create virtual water cooler discussions it seems to be very helpful in promoting innovation and scholarship. For those of you who are interested, I have recently published an article which is titled Medical Education During COVID-19 Lessons from a Pandemic. It is available open access in the British Columbia Medical Journal in the June issue. So I encourage you to take a look at that. One of the things that I wrote, and it was pulled out as a quote I want to share with you, is that I believe many adaptations, such as effective online instruction, are catalyzed by the urgency of the pandemic. Or to put it bluntly, it may be a new beginning, or so-called point of no return. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about this during our discussion. Because even after COVID-19 is over, many of the adaptations that we have taken may continue to be with us in medical education. 
And with that, I believe I've used up my allocated time exactly on the dot. So thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to hearing your sharing and our ongoing conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong. <coughs> For the inspiring and thought-provoking speech, and also thank you very much that uh, joining our state despite the time difference. Uh, for him, it is almost 10 30 p.m. So, uh, <laughs> have a great applause again for. <laughs> so there is about 50 people watching this webinar from YouTube and Facebook live stream. Again, I want to make a thank to the the one who is uh, in this webinar through the live stream. You can uh, take comments or questions in the chat box. So please feel free to leave comments. So, uh, so is there anyone uh, who wants to ask questions or make comments, to Professor? Please do. Yeah, uh, Professor Ian from the Seoul Asia University of State Dean of Medical Education. He has some questions to press the wall. Professor Ian, please. Roger, great talk, thank you. So you mentioned that students in quarantine at any given time will go to flexible advanced learning. Could you tell me a little bit more about flexible advanced learning? Uh, the flexible enhanced learning is a component of the medical curriculum at UBC that is throughout the entire four years. It is a four-year program for the MD degree, but it is a design as a spiral curriculum, which basically means that you have different competencies. It's a competency-based curriculum that actually teaches about the importance of education scholarship in terms of research, quality improvement and education scholarship. Those are the three domains. And you weave them into each of the four years. There's a requirement for the students to do a project somewhere down the line. And most of them do them in the end of the year four, which would have been the regular flexible course. With the pandemic, as the students got pulled out of the clinical activities and learning, we redesigned the curriculum by plugging out the flex course and re-plugging it back in to the time when they removed from the clinical setting. So many of the students, therefore, have now completed, say, the flex course before they return to the clinical training. The other thing I can add is as part of the faculty, we try to and, and try to help the students by saying if they're involved in any kind of, say, public health activity, then if that activity lends itself to have a scholarship component, we also try to give them credit. Let me give you one example. So in British Columbia, the public health officers actually work closely with some of our students who have clinical epidemiology training before medical school. So these students with COVID-19 have returned to public health to help to do the modeling of the data and therefore supplying the raw data to the public health doctors in making policy changes. We feel that kind of work clearly has a research scholarship component and therefore we give them credit as well. I hope that explains and illustrates the, the example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one question from Taipei Medical University. So it is in the chat room. I can uh, like uh, read it. It. How much experience did the faculty and students have with online education before the pandemic started, and what was the key element to ensure success? during the three-day transition to online education. So please, Dr. Wong. Absolutely. Thank you for that very insightful question from my colleagues at Taipei Medical University. Uh, to answer the first question, um, because the program in UBC is a distributed medical platform, as I explained before, 
we already have the infrastructure of high fidelity video conferencing prior to COVID-19, because that's the way how we have to teach with four regional medical campuses. Even though we have in-person activity at each of the four campuses, there are also a lot of activities and students and professors are used to video conference etiquette. And how do we teach while people from different campuses can actually in real time respond to um, in-class activity and interactions? When COVID-19 struck, therefore the transition in terms of that online piece is not the most difficult piece because we have the hardware available. I did give directions to our colleagues in the IT department to increase the number of licenses that we have for some of the online platforms. So some of the platforms that are most commonly used, for example, um, we actually end up using a lot of Zoom licenses, but you know, either WebEx or um, Microsoft Teams are the other two that have been talked about. The answer to the second part of the question, what was the key element to ensure success during the three-day transition? I think it was um, really paying attention to what is going on around the world. So I, as I share with you, I remember vividly for Canada, the pandemic broke the weekend of March 14th, 15th, 16th. I think the, like for many of us, those three days are blasted onto our cortexes. But even prior to that week, we already had observed data and numbers from around the world. And we already had a, a good bit of um, foresight and planning that what are we going to do if or when it were to strike Canada? British Columbia is a portal city. It is the entrance of the Pacific Rim to Canada. So we have already been learning from our colleagues across the Pacific Rim and trying to ask the question, what do we need to do? So exactly, we started to have these kind of conversation a little bit earlier than the actual three day, which it became a bit of a light switch phenomenon, which is switch on that, that contingency planning. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Wong, for uh, thank you once again for your wonderful speech, and thank you all for a uh, great discussion. Uh, now we are going to move on to the each uh, each country's unique situations. So we will have uh, five uh, presentations from five institutions of three countries first, and then we will have discussion time, and then we continue with the presentation session. So we, if, before we move to the, our uh, first presentation, I want to introduce a uh, vice dean of the Seoul Regional uh, Medicine. In order of sitting from next to the dean, we have a uh, vice dean for academic affairs, Professor Jung Kim. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Kim, actually a neurosurgeon, and I'm in charge of associate dean for academic affairs. And I hope this would be a great opportunity to discuss the new normal in medical education during this, this kind of a COVID-19. And nice to meet you all. And we have Vice Dean for Research Affairs, Professor Jayong Lee. Hi, I'm Jayong Lee, a radiologist. I'm great honor to uh, be with, with you uh, for this conference. So um, uh, through this meeting, I want to learn many things from all of you. Thank you. And also we have Vice Dean for Planning Affairs, uh, Professor Byung-Chol Kang. Hi, my name is Kang uh, Byung-Chol. Uh, I'm the, uh, the, the Vice Dean of the Planning. And simultaneously, I'm the, uh, the Director of the Rail Planning Facility. I'm interested in uh, the uh, animal models for the COVID-19 uh, infection. If you have a, a good model in your uh, institute, uh, I would like uh, to start about that. Okay. Uh, lastly, but not least, the Associate Dean for Medical Education, Professor Jae Joon-in. 
I'm an amateur criminologist. I'm very excited about discussing this education with you during the pandemic of COVID 19. Uh, he will move to this side to give his presentation about the situation in Seoul National. So uh, we will have discussion time after the presentation again. Uh, if you have any comments and questions, please leave comments. If you are watching or live streaming, or use the chat room function if you are participants joining the webinar. Okay. Uh, Professor Jejunim uh, will uh, speak about the situation of force. Professor Yim, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Professor Tri. Well, I'd like to introduce briefly what SCMU Medicine has experienced while confronting the pandemic of COVID-19. Can you confirm whether the audience can watch this slide? Fine. Okay, okay. so let, let me move on. So in, in South Korea, the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed on January 20th. And from mid-February, the number of new cases increased rapidly. And Korean government declared the highest alert level on February 23rd and initiated vigorous infection control measures, including physical distancing and contact tracing. Despite these interventions, the number of COVID-19 COVID cases peaked at March 1st, more than 1,000 patients per day in South Korea. When Korean government declared the highest alertness level, our curricula for sophomores Juniors and seniors were ongoing, but on February 24th, the day after the declaration of the highest alertness level, we suspended all classes. Immediately after suspending curricula, we started to prepare online lectures, and we initiated online lectures on March 16th, three weeks after suspension of all curricula. Online lectures were given three days. First, the professors recorded their lectures in studio, or they just added their voices on lecture slide. Then the recorded lectures or uh, slide with voices were uploaded at SNU e-teaching and learning website. Meanwhile, some professors preferred interactive online teaching using Zoom. Although the lectures were given online, the exams were performed offline. Our class size is 140, and we divide the students into four classes and four separate classrooms to maintain enough distance between them. Before the entrance, they filled up questionnaires about their travel history and their respiratory symptoms. In addition, our staff check the body temperature of every student. If temperature exceeds 37.5 Celsius degree, the student to exam in a separate room. In this spring semester, four students to exam separately because of their temperature. But fortunately, none of them was tested positive for COVID-19 eventually. In South Korea, from April 21st, the number of newly diagnosed cases fell below 10 in South Korea. So subsequently, we started lab classes and clinical rotations on May 4th. To minimize the risk of cross-infection between students, we divided them into three classes, while doing cadaver dissection and other lab uh, classes. Because of the limitation of time, space, cadaver, and teaching assistance, it was inevitable for us to reduce the opportunity of dissection for each, patient, each student. Now the question is how students and professors are satisfied with online learning and online teaching. Interestingly, over 6% of students prefer online learning. But on the contrary, professors prefer traditional in-person lecture. I interviewed dozens of students and found that students prefer online learning because of two reasons. First, they can watch lectures whenever and wherever they want. Second, they can stop playing, stop playing lectures 
when they could not understand the contents, and they can repeat it to understand. And next question is academic achievement of students taking classes online. We compared scores of CM courses between 2019 and 2020. The scores were maintained in all classes except anatomy class. For example, mean scores of biochemistry was 71 point out of 100 in 2019 and 74 in 2020. However, mean scores of anatomy decreased from 89 to 82. Our interpretation of this observation is that the reduction of opportunity of cadaver dissection made negative impact on students' understanding of human anatomy. This is a short summary of what SNU Medicine has experienced while confronting COVID-19. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Carmen Wong, uh, Assistant Dean for Education of the Chinese University of Hong Kong Faculty of Medicine, uh, will uh, present. Professor Wong, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Professor Carmen Wong, and I'm Assistant Dean of Education in the Faculty of Medicine here. So, um, our experience with uh, COVID-19 was very similar, and um, we were on high alert since um, there was a notification of human-to-human -human transmission. Um, and, as, and in January 2020, we had our first case very shortly after the lockdown of Wuhan. So within that, we actually had suspension of community and hospital attachment um, fairly early on. And within two weeks that actually spanned over Chinese New Year, we had online training of teachers. Uh, and most were actually trained within two weeks. We also had an online timetable of lectures, role plays, interactive tutorials, and virtual clinics um, that, were, that were actually placed um, very handily in a, in a timetable for students. Um, so they can click the link and actually um, be able to know their timetable sessions. Then from March to April was when our um, assessments uh, were mainly concentrated. Um, we actually um, had a principle of making sure that our students, uh, students graduated on time. So we made sure that the clinical uh, examinations could continue uh, despite um, uh, any uh, disruptions. So during that time, even though we were facing sort of the first and the second peak of COVID in Hong Kong, uh, we made sure that all our students completed uh, an online health declaration um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. During the exam precautions, they were using face masks, alcohol hand gel. We also had the site disinfected and there was adequate social distancing with groupings. So we have to make sure the logistics um, um, enable physical um, uh, distancing. Physical distancing was also um, used within the um, examination room. And we also used uh, a strategy such as the examiners rotating rather than students rotating between uh, uh, stations. Um, we use um, our online examiners, unfortunately, couldn't come on site, so we actually had them online. And so they could be live online or actually used uh, recorded sessions for quality control. Um, we managed to um, conduct all our face to face professional examinations successfully. Um, we did trial some uh, online um, uh, written examinations uh, for low stake exams. We did uh, experience some difficulties, both from students and both from teachers that felt that um, online uh, written examination were perhaps unfair. And we can perhaps discuss that um, uh, in the question and answer sessions if people are interested. So um, moving onwards, uh, what are we going to do from uh, uh, now on? So um, we are strengthening the infectious control training measures and particularly concentrating on our clinical team, um, our clinical attachments. So these are the pre-interns, uh, uh, medical year, four, five, and six, before they start their uh, clinical attachments. And actually, they've started their clinical um, attachments uh, uh, since July. So they've been doing this for a couple of weeks now. We had infectious control refresher talks. We also work with the hospital authority here. We have close uh, liaison with them so that um, they also have a training unit on COVID-19 with updates of the status in which the students uh, will have to do training. 
Um, we prioritizing uh, different years, and particularly with uh, pre-internship uh, first, then year five, and then year four, uh, so that they can all have their uh, clinical training. What else we have introduced um, to enable uh, clinical training? So you can imagine that most of the difficulties are not with preclinical, but with clinical uh, training, with um, uh, where they're on the wards, um, where they're in outpatients, and they're having clinical face-to-face uh, -face contact uh, with patients. So what we've done is that we've created an app um, that uh, has all the timetabling, time but what it also has is that um, uh, students fill in um, their, uh, any symptoms that they may have. We actually update this according to the situation. So for example, uh, more recently, if there's been an outbreak uh, in a certain uh, housing estate, then we would actually put that on there as a uh, criteria as well. They also uh, write down when they attended, uh, uh, what they attended, which ward they were on, and even the hospital numbers uh, um, of the patients, how many patients they saw, which tutor was taking them across. Um, and all of this enables a contact tracing. Um, so we are able to locate, even from the patient hospital number, uh, from the student number, um, any possible contacts um, uh, in real time uh, uh, that they've seen. So other adjustments that we're uh, doing this year, um, online lectures, online interactive uh, uh, um, uh, tutorials, live demonstrations, etc. Uh, most of which a lot of the medical schools uh, are doing. Um, we're trying to keep our face-to-face -face small group uh, discussions, uh, particularly for things that actually need um, uh, a more uh, um, face-to-face -face contact. Our prioritizations uh, for clinical uh, attachments, there are some pre-assigned uh, patients or clinical areas with case selections that actually reduces the infection risk. And in high-risk areas, uh, teaching uh, have not been permitted, such as isolation wards, um, endoscopy, uh, ward rounds, etc. We have also teacher documentation of patients seen as well. And we have student tracking of uh, clinical contact. So within uh, any time, we can actually be able to locate our students, and we also know uh, how many sessions they've attended. Now, moving forward for our contingency uh, planning, we have uh, different levels of preparedness, and this is at the course coordinator level and at the year coordinator level, and it's um, at sort of minimal uh, physical distancing uh, to a more serious level, an emergency level. And we actually work with sort of the, um, the government and also the hospital authority um, uh, um, to make sure that we have uh, an appropriate response. We have a rapid response team for urgent and emergency uh, situations, and which we are using currently, Hong Kong is facing a third wave. And so within this week, we've had to um, change um, the teaching methods um, of some of our um, uh, uh, courses. And most importantly is to actually continuously um, uh, communicate uh, with our students on any of the changes that we're uh, making. So those are the changes going forward into the next academic year for the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Wong. Uh, next is Professor uh, Shan Chan Lee. Uh, Director of Global Affairs, Kaohsiung Medical University, College of Medicine. Can you see my slide already? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this webinar. Hi, everyone. And, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to share uh, some of our Taiwan government policies. Early February, by Ministry of Education, the semester was postponed until February 25th. And also every bilateral activities associated with China, Hong Kong, and Macau is temporarily prohibited. And by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, travelers are, uh, they will be required to under home quarantines for 14 days since February 10th. And Taiwan's government learned from 2003 SARS experiments and had established a public health response mechanism for enabling rapid actions for this pandemic. And due to the experience of battling against the SARS, Taiwanese people have 
know that wearing face mask is a practical way to protect themselves. And it is imperative to wear masks in public area due to government regulations. Taiwan's mask rationing system plan ensures masks are fairly and equally distributed. Here are our KMU regulations. Um, we request the students and employees to wash hands very frequently and make good use of alcohol disinfection uh, that are located as, at many uh, corners on our campus. And only employees and students with ID can enter the campus with checking temperature. And they are requested to keep social distance at least 1.5 meter and avoid going abroad or crowded public place during the holiday, and they must wear masks while entering the administrative offices. And students and employees are re requested to complete report of travel history of March and after, after uh, that, that time on. On Office of Global Affairs website, uh, they announced 33 pharmacies within 20 minutes walking distance from KMU for students to get uh, access for buying face masks. And we offer alternative strategies while getting shortage of face masks. And we have the online uh, system for KMU Healthcare Passport. And they can uh, uh, have their load of recording their uh, body temperature and they can easily enter the campus with the uh, healthcare passport. And all students should wear face mask while entering the campus from April. And since May 10th, we stopped requesting all students wearing a mask or checking temperature. But we do, we, we do have uh, most students, they still wear a mask. Regarding the exchange student programs, um, all outbound events uh, are postponed until June 30th and inbound activities are put on to July 31st. And for the government policy, except for those who have entry permit already, foreigners are prohibited to enter Taiwan since March 19th. And all passengers should do home-based quarantine for 14 days. And for classes, um, we, we request uh, teachers to offer online courses whenever the students number over 100 and the students' attendance is recorded in the course. And they must wear face masks while taking classes. And uh, they are reminded to keep social distance. Indoor is one meter with mask and outdoor is 1.5 meters. And this is the computer desktop of all our classrooms showing regulations to remind teachers and students to follow. And this picture showing students <coughs> for checking temperature uh, after before they entering the campus and in this classes uh, classroom uh, students keep distance between each other this is one of the screenshots of our online courses for the uh, one lecture of internal medicine and that's not just in the campus uh, also in our university hospital just right next to our campus there are very strict regulations for all employees, visitors, patients, and medical students. And they are all required to hold their IDs or health insurance card to strive over one of the car sensors while measuring body temperatures before entering the hospital. And they, uh, all employees and medical students they must enter their body temperature recording each day, twice a day, and log in their travel and exposure history almost every week to control their uh, exposure. And luckily with all this under control, our medical students have their clinical uh, teach learning continues as their ordinary clerkship schedule. And our medical students, including uh, 150, medical students and uh, approximately 50 post-baccalaureate medical students, all of them passed their OSCE exam for this year. And I would like to stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Lee.
Uh, we will move on to Professor Hideki Katsuya, Associate Dean for International Affairs, Nagoya University Graduate School. Okay, this is uh, uh, Hideki Katsuya uh, from the uh, Nagoya University, uh, Japan. So today's uh, my title is COVID-19 Crisis uh, Management. So overview of Japan's situation amid the pandemic. The number of COVID-19 cases in Japan is uh, relatively small compared to other COVID-19 striking nations. Uh, it is assumed that the uh, current Japan situation would reflect good access to medical uh, services or the high level of the awareness about the uh, importance of hygiene. Uh, tackling uh, clusters of infections uh, contributed to uh, curbing the number of cases uh, considerably in Japan and was uh, verified as one of the effective uh, uh, countermeasures for that. Japan established a concept of the three C's. The first C is closed spaces, a second is uh, crowded places, and the third is close contact setting. In order to keep our students uh, vigilant, so an uh, overview of the uh, Nagoya University situation amid the pandemic. It's uh, now is a level two. The level two is uh, this red uh, 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 the uh, uh, squares. The um, meaning is after uh, taking the measures to uh, prevent a uh, spread of infection, uh, conduct lectures and uh, seminars. Uh, as a rules, a classes should be uh, conducted uh, remotely using the ICT. So uh, if the uh, exceptional uh, circumstance requires personal face classes, the number of the people must be limited. It's actually, the, uh, and there should be the F50. And the conduct experiment and uh, uh, practical training uh, with limited on numbers of people. Access point is open. That is a current situation uh, order from the uh, university. So our background is uh, during the early year 2020, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 forced universities around the world to debate classes online to avoid the uh, uh, propagation of infection. Online delivery of classes were uh, new for many students as well as for academic staff. So problem to uh, consider when delivery the classes, uh, social uh, interaction, and the different time zone from students to attend the courses. And the internet quality from student side is that uh, each student situation is different. And the motivated student and the evaluation student, how evaluate and the synchronous or asynchronous. So the synchronous online lecture, so-called uh, real time, so uh, usually to use at Zoom or Teams or similar platforms. The synchronous online actually advantage is classroom engagement. We are able to see students in live and also meet each other's face. And advantage too is the interaction dips. The third is the interactive. The student can ask immediately. The instructor can make queries in live. Those one is advantage of the synchronous online. And also the uh, disadvantages of the synchronous online lecture. Number one is um, rigid uh, schedule, uh, not adequate for students in different time zone. Number two is a technical difficulty. Number three is a student without good internet access will be in disadvantage to take the course. And uh, so another aspect of the asynchronous online lectures. So uh, asynchronous the online lecture advantage is uh, flexibility, a uh, convenient for courses for students of different time zone attended. And the pacing, the making a pace, a build on your own time, rewind this again, the student can review as many times as they wish. Number three, so uh, assignment can be added to evaluate student understanding. So a disadvantage of the asynchronous online lecture is 
Number one is no direct interaction between students and lectures. Uh, difficult to evaluate student uh, motivation and understanding. Number two is uh, some technical knowledge is needed, recording or video audio editing from lecture side. So uh, NU established, Nama University established our original uh, LMS learning management system for our students. It's named NUCT, uh, dedicated to the uh, online self-study. Uh, this application uh, facilitates students to be engaged in their online learning and assist the faculty member to uh, conduct their lecture online. How to run educational materials, for example, PowerPoint, movie, pictures, or documents for each subject are uploaded on NUCT. Uh, students study them by themselves and uh, take a brief quiz for their deeper understanding within the certain period. After self-study, they can ask teachers about their questions via email, SNS, or an online application, Zoom, or Teams. So a conclusion, in online teaching, the lecturer have many options to deliver the class, and it's important to decide which system to use when considering the type of class we need to deliver. The real-time online lectures give better idea to the lecture about the motivation from the student's side as well as the understanding. Have advantage for smaller classes, maybe that's why up to 20 students, and unsequenced method combined to find different time zone students attend as well as in good choice for larger classes, maybe over 50 to 200 about. And evaluation may differ on each type of delivery. The lecturer has to decide what's the main goal in order to choose the best way to deliver online lectures. That's all. Thank you very much. So we will move on to the last speaker of this session, uh, Ms. Elaine Chung, Senior Executive of this Office in National University of Singapore School of Medicine. Uh, since Ms. Chong is not able to join us today uh, due to an unforeseen situation, she has kindly sent us a recorded PowerPoint file so that we can share it. It's in chronos. Another kind of asynchronous. Yes, this is the asynchronous type of uh, webinar. Yeah. Uh, if you wait a little bit. I would like to thank Seoul National University, the Dean, Professor Chan, Director of International Affairs, Ms. Sunju, for organizing this meaningful <laughs> event. My name is Elaine, and I will do a short sharing session from NUS Yongluin School of Medicine. This will be the outline of the day. Due to COVID-19, our preclinical medical students had to shift their lectures and tutorials online via Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Students had the opportunity to conduct small group discussions with virtual breakout rooms on Microsoft Teams. Students have responded that they were more willing to interact with their lecturers and professors on the online platform. And our final year medical students have graduated. They managed to complete their final year clinical exams before the circuit breaker period was implemented in Singapore. Next, we'll be regarding the new initiatives for year three and year four elective students. During the COVID-19 period in Singapore, this group of students were the ones that were most affected as they were in their clinical years. So students were not allowed to go to local hospitals to carry out clinical postings, and they also had to cancel their overseas elective plans. Hence, the school created a new initiative called the Pathway Electives. This is an overview of the Pathway Electives. In this schedule, you can see the plan for Year 4 Medical Elective students. The first two weeks consist of online-based learning in the form of online lectures and webinars. It also consists of an introduction to each of the six pathway tracks. So the six pathway track, tracks that students can choose from are namely Health and Humanity, Inquiry and Thinking, Education Innovation, Health Informatics, Medical Education, and Medical Innovation and Entrepreneurship. After week two, students have to choose a pathway to specialize in for eight weeks. So now I will touch on each of the pathway briefly. So firstly is the health and humanity track. So through the health and humanity pathway, the students would rediscover the heart behind medicine. So although our students are training to be doctors, but through this pathway, we hope to cultivate the heart of medicine in our students. So what is the learning outcome? 
Students will be able to appreciate the crucial intersection between health and art and to restore the humanity of medicine. So the project in components include a creative deliverable, a written reflective piece and a scholarly piece based on research of a particular health topic. Students can work in groups or individually on projects at the intersection of heart and topics related to ethics, mental wellness, end of life care or any other proposed topics. Next, there's the Health Informatics Pathway. So this is a new undergraduate longitudinal track spanning across year one to five to prepare a cohort of graduates who are data science competent. So the aim of this pathway is to allow students to understand the principles of medical informatics and train students to perform basic analysis of data sets to develop a health informatics proposal. So for instance, students will be able to learn to use data software such as Python, etc. There's also the education innovation track. So this pathway aims to design innovative solutions for teaching and learning. So these are some examples of the kind of projects that we encourage students to do. So for example, they can work together in teams to develop a mobile application for procedural skills, or they can actually work on a virtual reality project for training healthcare workers on PPE. So students are also free to suggest any other projects. Next, there's the inquiry and thinking pathway. So this consists mainly of research projects, or we can call it scholarly projects. But the focus of this pathway is not just about the kind of project topics, but rather is to train students to know how to ask good questions and to conceptualize their project and write good proposal papers. So at the end of the course, students will be able to ask good research questions, understand the various process and methods of research, able to consolidate learning and writing a good proposal, and appreciate how research complement clinical practice. We also have the medical education pathway. So this is a new longitudinal pathway spanning across year one to five to repair a call of graduates who are interested in health professions education. So some students may wonder about how is the medical curriculum formed or what is the basis of assessing them and what are the teaching and learning approaches they are available out there. So through this pathway, it aims to allow students to gain gradual exposure of concepts and principles in health professions education and allow them to be equipped with foundational skills in health professions education with a focus on educational innovation and scholarship of teaching and learning. So lastly, we have the medical innovation and entrepreneurship pathway. This is a new longitudinal pathway spanning across year one to five to nurture the six C attributes in NUS medicine undergraduates. So the, at the end of this pathway, the students should be able to gain a graduate exposure of concepts and principles in innovation and be equipped with foundational skills in innovation and entrepreneurship. So these are the six C's that we wish to cultivate in our students. So lastly, during the COVID-19 period, we have managed to develop the interprofessional education as the students are unable to go to the hospital for their usual walk rounds. We have created an online platform whereby it's a virtual hospital and teams of students from different healthcare courses are given the opportunity to engage in multidisciplinary bed round, bedside rounds and discharge care planning. This allows them to communicate among themselves and also come up with plans for the patient. So this allows different healthcare professions to communicate with and understand one another's roles and responsibilities. So at the end of this Bedside, virtual bedside rounds, there, there will be a facilitator to actually debrief and allow them to reflect on their learning experiences. So these 3D virtual environments are thus a viable innovative tool that can transcend time and space by bringing together learners from different local or even inter international health education campuses together. So I, before I end off this presentation, I would like to share a video on the 3D virtual walk round. Thank you, stay safe and healthy.
be the possible impact on the patient or other healthcare profession. One of the best things that I really took away is uh, learning how to interact with the professionals. These are the professionals that we really need to interact with but we don't get the chance until we really step into the hospitals for our placement. When we actually do that, right, it is very awkward in the beginning. So this serves as a very good platform for us to bridge between school and going into the going into the real working world. The biggest takeaway is that I got to see what all the other healthcare professionals have been doing. I actually realised like, what is it that they look out for? What are their concerns? What is their perspective of the clients? I think having a common understanding will help like, the whole team work a lot better together. IP training is important to me because it prepares me for the workforce thing. So with this training, I think it will help future students with this and prepare them better for their coming attachments. What I gained was a newfound chance to work with colleagues from not just uh, Allied Health but colleagues from other institutions as well to see um, like in differences in terms of what we aim for the patient. I've been in medical school for five years. The difference is, is that at the start when I was a, a younger medical student, IP training was very much a social thing. It was just all oh, play orientation games and uh, there was a good social bonding and then towards the end it became just uh, straight straight up we started working in the wards. So to me there seemed to be a bit of a culture shock because on top of having to work in, in an actual working environment, we even had to learn how to be collegial on top of that. So I think that jump is quite, quite drastic, quite difficult. And I think this IP simulated environment allows us to bridge that really well. So I am sorry to tell you that due to time limitation, uh, we could not fully show you all the presentation file by this show. Uh, we will upload the full presentation to our homepage and YouTube site. So please excuse us for any inconvenience. So before we move on, uh, we will have about uh, 10 minutes discussion time. So. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to speak up or use the chat room and uh, make comments on the chat box. So, Chan Su Xin has the question, please. Hi, uh, we haven't talked much about the year one or two curriculum of medical school, I mean, Beijing Medical Sciences. Uh, we are very much concerned about the labs, especially, I mean, anatomy, physiology, or microbiology labs. Because how can you reduce or compress those curriculum uh, in the context of COVID-19? So can you share your experience for this uh, year one or two program, if you have any comment or hint? This is Roger Wong from the University of British Columbia. May I chime in? Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, it is indeed a very challenging situation with in-person laboratory instruction. What we have done at UBC are two things and happy to share with colleagues uh, around uh, the table today. The first thing is really to ask the question, for the competencies that are taught in year one and year two, the basic or foundational sciences, for those in-person components, what we call the labs, um, can they actually be taught, some of those competencies, can they be taught through online instruction methodology? If part of those can be done online, we change to online, for example, the instruction of anatomy, gross anatomy, neuroanatomy, and so on. At UBC, we actually have cadaveric dissection historically. But in order to um, a transition to an online mode, we actually have used some of our emerging media technology by mm -hmm. 3D scanning some of the specimens and changing them into YouTube videos of teaching, for example, neuroanatomy. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage uh, my colleagues, if you're interested, to check on the YouTube site. Our Professor Claudia Krabs is one of our neuroanatomists, and she has done quite a bit of uh, global neuroanatomy teaching using emerging technology. 
such as the HoloLens or such as other way of three-dimensional scanned images. So we are changing as much of our neuroanatomy and our gross anatomy instruction to online using some of these newer methodology when possible. That said, there will still be some that require in-person. And what we do is staggered scheduling, making sure physical distancing can be met. Uh, the challenge there we have found is actually in our physical buildings because these are shared buildings with other faculties and schools. By and large, we have our own buildings, but then they are shared at least amongst different programs. So it is not as straightforward to just have, instead of housing, for example, 30 people in a room, we now, in the same space, may only be able to put 10 in. And we cannot schedule three times the number of labs because otherwise I need three times the number of instructors and professors. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the lessons that we have learned. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any other questions or comments, feel free to speak up. Okay, then we will move on to the presentation uh, again. So next, we have National Taiwan University College of Medicine. Uh, happily, we have Professor Wang Hui Shang. The chairperson of stroke medicine at National Taiwan University with us. So, uh, Professor Chia Hui Chen, Associate Dean for International Affairs, National Taiwan University College of Medicine, will present uh, the situation at National Taiwan University. Professor Chen, you have the floor. Please pick up. Pick up. Are you here? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you, Professor Lee, <laughs> friends and colleagues. So nice to know that all of you have been strong and well, 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 the pandemic. I do want to take this opportunity to thank you, Seoul National University, for the opportunity uh, to present in this webinar. I'm Cheryl Chen. Dr. Shen, as the chairperson at School of Medicine, has joined me. Together, we will share the impact and adaptation of our medical program in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And yeah, again, I'm Cheryl. The impact of COVID-19 on medical education is unprecedented. We are on high alert right at the beginning due to our experience of SARS epidemic back on um, year 2003. At NTU Medicine, discussion started in early January to monitor the situation and plan for possible measures to ensure the safety and well-being of students. Difficult decisions have to be made to cancel the international activity and scholarship. At the end of January, we started to cancel some of the open activities. The university delayed the start of the semester by two weeks to March 2nd as defense against COVID-19. We still take few incoming students in February, even their strong desire to study at NTU, and it is also possible hard for them to find alternative at such short notice. However, fever screening at both places and very soon the quarantine order along with the national travel advisory make us have to cancel all the inbound and outbound medical elective and international activities by March 7th. Currently the border is still sealed Taiwan and no visitor is allowed in the campus. Sorry to let you know that all inbounds are cancelled for the year of 2020. Therefore, the impact is high. With pandemic, the student international mobility has broken, period. 
Just to give you some number, from January to August 2020, originally 187 students are scheduled to visit NTU College of Medicine. One more way turned out to cancel for sure, with the rest of 79 postponed. Those students, they reschedule to the next year, hoping to come when the situation abates. Outgoing, we have 126 are scheduled to go abroad. Only 13 went as planned in January or early February before the outbreak worsened. So this pandemic has forced us to examine all elements of our medical program. And this new normal clearly is fluid and might change frequently. I'm going to turn the stage to Dr. Shen, who is also a infectious disease physician at NTU Hospital to take us through the adaptation of medical education at NTU Medicine. Professor Chen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chen. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Professor. Uh, I'm Dr. Wang Hui Shen. So I will uh, discuss and uh, talk about uh, the uh, preparation of a medical education at the National Taiwan University Medical School. So in this slide, uh, we show that in Taiwan, we had a consensus decision making for medical education in Taiwan. That's called Taiwan Medical Abbreviation Council, which consists of 13 medical schools in Taiwan. The dean's chairperson and the director of medical education in the 13 medical schools in Taiwan. We met together regularly to discuss about the decision for facing the COVID-19 area. So in Taiwan, we are very lucky that has so much uh, of a patient of COVID-19. So uh, all of the medical school remains open during the COVID-19 epidemic. So this slide show how we run uh, the major uh, educational program in National Taiwan University. We uh, also had a hybrid teaching during COVID-19. For example, the first year and the second year of medical students, they are all on the online uh, classes. But for the year three and the year four, there were more than 60% of the class became online schedule. For example, a synchronous distance teacher video or synchronous distance discussion using Zoom meeting. So the first part of the hybrid teaching program is online course. The second, we remain uh, some of the small classes for the in-person interaction course. For example, as a request for the university side and the government to cut the class size of a medical student limited to up to 60 person in a class. So we had some smaller group group teaching in the clinical side or in the school side. And the, the student should wear their facial mask all of the time during the in-person interaction course. And we also had a policy that if a, a medical student had some uh, symptoms or had a sick, they can flexible day without any uh, regulation. And the last is uh, about the laboratory clinical rotation with names practical. So if a medical student for example, the year five and the year six, the medical rotation program still remain open. So the medical student should uh, be training on proper personal protective equipment use before they enter to the clinical 
glasses and the, the patient side. However, the medical student did not would like and the, we should not want today to care about the, the COVID-19 positive patient, including the patient in the isolation room. And the student will check the temperature at all entry of the hospital and the, the school. And also, every student should report their self health monitoring every day. For example, the body temperature and the symptom every day to the medical office. So this is an example of the year three and the year four of the medical school curriculum. Because uh, more than 60% of the classes were moved to online uh, preparation and the online uh, teaching. So we adjust uh, about uh, the open system-based learning for this medical student. For example, in the third year, we had to uh, integrate the physiology, anatomy, neuroanatomy, and rheology established into a basic integrated classes. So the teacher preparation of the online classes, they should integrate all the basic medical science into a class. For a fourth year medical student, there were more clinical science. So the classes uh, we integrate about the pathology, clinical diagnosis, pharmacology, laboratory medicine, and the clinical treatment in the class. That's more convenient and more efficient for the medical learning for the student. So this is an example of the figure we built the scaffold in organ system basis integrate curriculum during the COVID-19 pandemic in Taiwan. So every class we had to integrate the organ system based and uh, all of the classes such as the online course or some of the physical course we had to integrate all of the field of a medical science into a class. Finally, I would like to introduce about the video teaching learning record. So in this slide, we can see in the left side, the video teaching learning record and the, for the evaluation of the student in the right side, we can see every student on the video learning completion rate. For example, this is uh, three students and uh, during their daytime from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We can see each student and uh, each video learning time. So we can uh, control and uh, we can see how is the student learning from the online course. And uh, the below is a video learning record. So we can also evaluate how many students in the online class and when they learn about the video classes. So this is uh, the preparation and the report in National Taiwan University. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chen, and thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, so now let's move on to uh, Peking University Health uh, Center. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Dr. Hong yes. Hong okay. Liu, okay. Director, Office of Undergraduate Education. Uh, here, uh, she will uh, present uh, our situation. Okay, Dr. Yes. Liu. Yes. May I start? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm Hong Liu. I'm Dr. Hong Liu from Beijing. So I'm very happy to share uh, our experience with you. First of all, here are some uh, history about uh, our university. Peking University was a very famous and we'll look a comprehensive uh, national key university. And the uh, Peking University Health Science Center was China's first government-funded 
School of Western and Medicine Education. So we are very proud of it. And the year of uh, 2000, the two universities merged together. And so we got uh, the name uh, PKU, Health Science Center now. Oh, here. Here are some of the structure and the enrollment in the PKU Health Center. We have five on-campus schools, and uh, we have six affiliated hospitals. And each year, there would be 900 students uh, take part in our undergraduate program, and over uh, uh, around 1,500 students participate in our postgraduate uh, program. So, uh, this picture shows everything changed uh, just before the Chinese New Year. COVID-19 outbreak uh, in our winter holiday. So it changed the way we live. Uh, you can see from the picture, everyone wash their hands and wear masks. And so uh, <laughs> the education, the education uh, has been changed by this virus. So the first phase is from the end of January to uh, 16 February. Uh, that we are fortunate today because we still have three weeks before the spring the semester, the semester begins. So we have three weeks to prepare uh, for the for the for the next term. So we made a big decision. That decision is. We have to close the campus in the next term, but we have to keep the teaching and the learning uh, continually. So everyone aware, we have no choice. Only the online education is the only solution. We have to, we have to finish it. We have to achieve it. So we ask the old teachers. They have to start to work. They have to prepare all the learning materials online. Because before that, uh, most of the teachers had no experience uh, on the online teaching. So we established uh, a platform immediately. We got uh, uh, a support from a, a learning management system company. We get their support. So we established all the courses on this platform. So the teachers have to produce the learning materials they needed. For example, uh, the syllabus of each course and the instructions of each course. And then we need the teacher to prepare their screen recording plus narration for each of the course. And they have to upload all these kind of materials on the uh, learning management system. So the teachers at that time were very worried. So we have a strong uh, technology team to support them, to work with them uh, around the clock. And at the same time, we uh, connected with each student. We called to them and to tell them what will be happen in the next term and ask them what support they need. So some of the students just need some financial support. For example, they need money to buy computers or to buy cell phones. Or some of them just need to buy some uh, Wi-Fi packages. So we finish them during this three weeks. And then the next phase is the implementation phase. Uh, from the beginning of the spring semester to the end of this semester, we finish the, all, the whole teaching and the learning exercise, including the lectures, the homework, the assessments, the final examinations, and even the final defenses online because the students are not allowed to come back to the campus. All these activities have to be finished uh, by the internet. And, and our teachers are very uh, 
they are very talented. They use various ways and tools in their classroom. For example, they can uh, use the real time lecture uh, to have the real lecture, uh, the synchronized lecture with their uh, students. And some of the teachers uh, to use they, this time to have discussions with their uh, students. And uh, they, we also have some PBL and CBL uh, that is uh, online conferences in this way. And also we have some senior experts. They are invited to be the supervisors and they join this uh, whole, the whole activities online. They listen, they join to the classroom and, and they, they this, uh, this is a good opportunity for them to follow all the uh, lessons put on the uh, learning management system. And here are two pictures. These are uh, screenshots from our platform. And you can see the material, how many resources we have, and how, how many courses, and how many students and teachers uh, finish their work on this platform. And this slide shows the benefits we get from this kind of new uh, education model. For example, teachers' technology skills have been improved a lot. And they have confidence on this uh, online study. And students can study on their own pace. They can preview and they can review uh, all this kind of uh, PPT plus narration at their own needs. And another benefit is the administrators can follow all this online activity. And the, another benefit is the teacher, the teaching contents are standardized and the best resources are shared much easier than before. And here? Yes. Yes, that's some um, next uh, future steps we will, we will take. Uh, what we are facing in the next semester is a new normal about COVID-19. That means uh, maybe we'll coexist with this virus. Maybe it will come in a second wave or the third wave. That means some of the students could not come back to the campus next semester. And uh, another challenge we are facing is now we are having the education reforming. That means the content uh, of the or the, cor the courses will be more integrated and uh, we will give more freedom uh, uh, to the students. They will study at their own pace or at their own interest. So we'll give them more freedom. And the, and the third condition we are facing is uh, now the learners, the students are native internet uh, learners. They are, they are more comfortable uh, to study online. And the, and the teachers, uh, when they experience, they have this good experience, they are more mature and more confident about uh, this, online, this online study. So the next, um, uh, the next semester, they all have blended learning as our uh, education model. Oh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Xu Yin Huang, Vice Director, and Dr. Daniel Aichado, uh, Director of the Educational Research from Taipei Medical University School of Medicine, will present their situation one after the other. Uh, Professor Fang, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting us to attend the webinar. Uh, I still re remember that uh, in February uh, 11th, I, I, I have uh, seen most of the, the attendees uh, in uh, Seoul National University. But uh, five, for the past, uh, past five, five months, the world has changed a lot. But I think uh, human beings have great potential. That's why we are here. to to attend this uh, webinar to exchange uh, experience from each other. Uh, so today I, I, I represent, I and uh, my colleague, Daniel Sarchedo, 
who is the director of the Clinical Medical Education Center, to share at the Taipei Medical University experiences with you. Uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, speakers uh, from Taiwan has already talked a lot about the, our governmental policy and the campus. Uh, so for the COVID-19, so I will skip uh, uh, mo most of them and then and allowed my colleague to explain and introduce more about the innovation in clinical education and the clinical training at the T Taipei Medical University. Uh, our government, our government ex established the Central Academic Command Center, and our Minister of Health and Welfare, Dr. Chen, uh, who actually uh, hold the press congress every day to communicate with our uh, all the Taiwanese people. So far, we have seen that more than thirteen million people has got the COVID nineteen worldwide. In Taiwan, so far we have a, a, a totally four hundred and fifty one confirmed cases uh, with uh, seven deaths. But fortunately, we have already no uh, new confirmed cases uh, dom domestically for the past two months. Months. Uh, our, our government uh, have uh, three uh, major interventions, including home isolation, quarantine, and self health management according to the different uh, uh, risk of uh, infection. Uh, in Taipei Medical University, we have uh, some uh, epidemic uh, prevention and control policy on campus. However, I will just uh, skip uh, this detail because uh, our colleagues, has, uh, it is quite similar to the previous uh, uh, speakers. We also have uh, some uh, di uh, different uh, units uh, uh, responsible for uh, different uh, uh, staff and uh, students. Of course, um, uh, wearing masks and uh, uh, social distances and uh, uh, access control are very important. And we also have a uh, principle in the announcement of uh, suspending, resuming, and uh, making up classes according to the uh, different uh, situations. However, we are very uh, lucky and we have uh, no such uh, announcement. We also have uh, some travel ban according to different uh, labels of uh, regions uh, of uh, travel advisory. We also guiding our students' activities according to the uh, different uh, uh, epidemic status. Fortunately, uh, we still uh, we we have uh, no confirmed. Uh, uh, we we have. Uh, not uh, suspended our courses and uh, uh, or canceled our ca classes on campus. Uh, this is uh, some APP of uh, Taipei Medical University. Every student downloaded the APP and also they need to, to record uh, their body temperature and uh, monitor their physical status every day and report it to, to our uh, university. We have a very flexible state study measures uh, for all the courses allowing uh, online study, like uh, uh, most of the, your, uh, the, the spe uh, previous speakers said, uh, course uh, teachers record or share teaching uh, materials using PowerCam on our uh, platform for medical students, uh, including the synchronized or non-synchronized distance learning, uh, teaching modules such as uh, using videos or real-time discussion or interaction. For laboratories and some seminars, uh, service uh, learning, uh, physical education, and the uh, practicums, we uh, allow the, uh, some flexible adjustment in the study content based on the situation. For special needs, uh, uh, students can take courses in other universities. And then uh, now we, uh, we just ask uh, Dr. Daniel Salcedo for the continuing part. Okay, hi, good afternoon. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Daniel. Uh, just before I start, I just want to emphasize, so I, I'm a bedside teacher. I've been a bedside teacher for about 15 years. And one of my first concerns with the pandemic was, what are we going to do to, to continue to train our students? in order to guarantee society that we are graduating practice-ready physicians, right? So, so uh, there were several measures that were taken 
Some of them, I think, have already been mentioned before by, by many of you. But what I would like to maybe emphasize is on the clinical training side, because that, that was kind of one of our big concerns. So what we did is we partnered up with Google and uh, Acer and a couple of other uh, local companies to develop a clinical, remote clinical teaching system, right? And what we did is we designed a system which would allow us to train students in, in case diagnosis and management, to uh, provide interprofessional education at the clinical site, to uh, provide also early clinical exposure for learners to, to, to be able to join remotely, uh, to, to have a way to teach ethics and professionalism at the point of care, as well as clinical communication, and also to prepare students for the future of what's coming with medical practice in terms of telemedicine. So we got together and we came up with a develop, developing a system that would allow us to share live, live stream clinical data to the students from the point of care. The reason why we were so interested in doing this live is because part of the, what we learned in the hospital is how to make clinical decisions that are timely, right? It's very easy to, to get take a case and you know you just Google up the, the answers and all that. But our concern was how do we teach our students to do clinical reasoning on the fly when it's needed. So we decided to have a system that would allow us to live stream data uh, simultaneously. Um, the idea was to isolate the point of care since it's a high risk location. So the, the point of care was completely isolated from the other participants, which were the healthcare team members could remote, join remotely. Our learners were joining from home. We had a moderator that was learning, joining from, from the main campus. Um, and they were not exposed to the point of care through the, uh, through the system. Uh, we used a, a universal design approach uh, to, to developing the system that allowed us to do very rapid uh, prototyping. We went from the left from that very ugly proof of concept all the way to a beta prototype in under 90 days. So it was a very, very rapid development cycle using focus groups of learners, focus groups of faculty, and focus groups of patients in order to refine the design quickly. Uh, this is a short video just to show you how it works. Uh, this is an early, early video, so I apologize. The quality is not as good as it is now, but we can do clinical history taking. So here you can see uh, the doctor interacting with the patient, or the learners can also interact with the patient through the system or with caretakers in this particular case. Uh, we also teach physical exams, so we can give macro views of the physical examination approach in patients, but also it lets us zoom in to talk about clinical signs that could have an impact on diagnoses and how to interpret them and the sharing of live clinical uh, data like heart sounds. After that, we're able to do uh, case discussions with the learners to make a management plan, to look at the labs, to discuss to see uh, what, what are we going to do about this patient. All of this while reducing the use of uh, personal protection equipment and also ensuring the safety of our patients, our faculty, and our learners as well. Uh, regarding assessment, uh, we designed a series of assessments that go with the system. Uh, in, 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 at the clinical space, we use the framework of the AAMC Entrustable Professional Activities for Entering Residency. And uh, using this online system, we're able to evaluate most of them. There are three of them that we can't really evaluate online, but the rest of them we can evaluate uh, through our system. It's going to give us a better idea about what's going on and, and to identify learners that are having trouble and to kind of make sure that everybody's getting what they should be getting, even if they can't come to the clinical site. So um, we would like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, we're looking forward to our uh, Q&A session. And um, thank you very much yeah, for having you. us. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, last but not least, we have Professor Satoshi Takeda, Head of the Emergency Department and Vice Director of the Center for International Affairs, uh, DK University School of Medicine. Uh, Professor Satoshi Takeda will share his situation briefly. Uh, Professor Takeda? Uh, thank you very much uh, to give us uh, this kind of the opportunity to present and share the experience in COVID-19. Uh, we are so happy to join with you. Um, uh, situation uh, in Japan, uh, Dr. Kasia already presented about. So I'd like to much more focus on a situation in GK University or Tokyo area. Uh, fight 
to COVID-19 in Japan started, especially for us, GK University fighting to COVID-19 started from February, uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship, uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. And the uh, March to May, we had the first peak or first wave. And every day we have 100 to 200 new patients for COVID-19. And once settled down, but the, uh, this July, we restarted to increase the page, new patient number, like 100 to 200 per day. So we are still uh, facing the very nervous situation. And especially for medical education, uh, medical education area, uh, much, we have to stop our classes and the clinical classes, and also stop ac acceptance uh, elective students from ab abroad. We are so, so sorry, and we are so sad. And the, uh, right now, uh, we, from May, we started to use the Moodle, uh, e-learning with Moodle or Zoom system, as many countries already mentioned about. And the doc as Dr. Katsuya mentioned, uh, we have a synchronized uh, system like Zoom or uh, unsynchronized with the Moodle e-learning system. And the, this Ju July, we restarted to have the uh, clinical classes or uh, classes uh, in GK University. But it, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we Study, least study the COVID-19 new patient in this July. So we still in COVID-19 era. So uh, we our medical education will be changed as well as the other countries uh, like you. Uh, thank you very much. This kind of the opportunity to join this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, here about this. We have about 10 more minutes, if you will agree. So we will have about 10 minutes discussion time. So feel free to ask any questions and make comments, please. So, yeah. Jim, please. Yes. Uh, I'm very impressed by the innovative teaching system from TMU. I guess that uh, you have been developing this system before the COVID-19. Uh, can you suggest any new modification or application you can use this system in the new normals uh, of COVID-19 era? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your question, uh, Professor Park. Uh, so actually this system was uh, entered development in February. So it was after the COVID mm -hmm. started. So that's why we, we were rushed to, to develop something in order to respond to the situation. So it was a very short development curve that required a lot of collaboration with industry in order to, to get it finished uh, in time for it to, to have a, an impact. Now, you're mentioning something very important. So what happens with this after COVID, right? Because we're investing all this in development. What are, you know, is this going to be in the corner gathering dust? Uh, the answer is no. There, there's several applications that we can use. One is early clinical exposure i think is essential an essential application to this because we haven't been able to solve this problem right we are not bringing the learners early enough to the clinical site to learn so this is one way in which we can bring large amounts of learners to the bedside without having to expand our facilities so that's one important area that we're looking at uh, another area is the the scheduling of interprofessional education because that's another big challenge right getting the nurses and the pharmacists and the, and the respiratory therapists and the medical students all in the same place, it's very difficult to do. But we've been doing this online quite successfully. It's easier for people to schedule sessions when they're working online. So that's another big area that we have. Um, and then the last thing is we're also seeing this as a way to prepare our learners for the future, which is uh, the, the, you know, the, the, really, uh, the ad adoption of telemedicine as a standard of care in health. In, in health. So that's another area that we're very, very interested in exploring. Um, so that's kind of like the three big things that we see happening afterwards. Uh, and we hope that the system you know, will continue to operate well. Thank you. Any question from the chat room? Oh, yeah, you can use the chat room function. So please feel free to use the uh, 
chair room. Okay, uh, that's a door. Is. Yes, I would, I would like to ask a question in general because uh, it's something that I'm really interested in. What do you see as the new normal in your clinical education? Because kind of we're, we're, we're going back to that transition in which we're thinking, okay, what is, uh, what is clinical training going to look like in the future, right? Are we going to be doing, going back to the same thing or are we going to be... So I'd be very interested in hearing what is your opinion about this and what do you think the new normal is going to look like in clinical training? Is, uh, Wong from, <laughs> is, is Roger Wong from UBT. May I start off with that and then invite colleagues to chime in after this? Yes, I, I really think I really think that many of us today have been talking about the meaning or implications of the new normal. Um, and that is we're making an assumption that COVID-19 uh, will eventually be over. And let's hope that is the case, because right now it does not appear that it's going to be over in any short time. So new normal may not be an event. It may be a process. I think that's really important to, to keep in mind. I would predict, to answer Daniel's question, that um, a lot of the pedagogical considerations that we have already been talking about, whether it is competency-based frameworks, whether it is about the different ways of building your curriculum. And the example that I use, I spoke about the spiral curriculum in terms of a way of delivery, which is again, uh, very uh, closely attached to the concept of and, and trustable professional activities, milestones, competencies, that whole schema. I think that piece, if not already here, is here to stay. Therefore, when you apply that kind of concept to clinical training, it really boils down to the question of what are the clinical competencies that we want our learners to take at various stages of their training? And then the question, depending on what these competencies are and what gradation you're talking about, the methodology of delivery may actually be, and I like that word, I think I saw that word blended approach, hybrid approach. I think that also is part of the new normal. It's blending or hybrid of something. Now that something does not necessarily mean online plus in-person. That is the most obvious blending. But it may mean other forms of blending. I would encourage us, and I go back to what uh, Dean Shin was talking about earlier on, from the early phase training, you know, in terms of the basic science and foundational science, that hybrid or blending may be the basic science with the clinical applied science. It could definitely be using different types of technology that blend. So even online doesn't mean a single thing. When you have synchronous and asynchronous delivery, and we talk a lot about that today, mainly using platforms like Zoom or WebEx or Teams or whatever, there's only one kind of technology. There is the whole piece of augmented reality. Some of our colleagues here at UBC, we have started teaching using augmented reality, which is mixed reality with virtual reality. When we teach neuroanatomy, I'll talk about the HoloLens example. Students are now able, by wearing the HoloLens, they can, with a turn and a flip, turn a structure in the brain into a CT scan or MRI image right within the lens. And that kind of technology coupled with radiographic images of real patients can really, that, that, that AR, augmented reality, is one way of blending or hybrid, the way how we teach anatomy, for example. I think the final thing that I would say to answering Daniel's question is, it depends on how we are assessing. And I, what, something that really resonates with me is we're preparing learners so that they're ready for their next phase of their training trajectory. In the case of undergraduate medicine, that means they are going into either a house officer post or a residency training post. Therefore, the kind of training that, you, that is required is to get the person to there. 
And how do you get there? I believe there are multiple ways of going there. There's not a single right or wrong, good or bad answer. What needs to happen is we build on our own local experiences and expertise. If we have something that seems to be working, you leverage on that. I think one of the things that I've learned very quickly on is the student's perspective of going online. While their excitement level is definitely higher than some of my tenure professors, and I'm not trying to over stereotype this in terms of that getting used to it, the thing to remember is students are elated. They are just elated when they get to physically go back to the clinical ground. And even with physical distancing, in small numbers, we reduced exposure. That actual presence in the clinical ground with a patient is a crucial part of professional identity formation. I think in the meta literature in the next couple of years, we'll start to see a lot of work, research work, education research work, to looking at how do we form professional identity of health practitioners, including future doctors, when we are delivering online, because that component is still a black box. So those are some of my comments. Hopefully that answer uh, the question and welcome my colleagues to chime in in that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions and comments? Professor Yin, please. So I completely agree with Roger's opinion about that. But if you are focused, if you are uh, teaching economics or business or mathematics, online learning uh, could be could be perfect. But we are dealing with medicine, so I think, in my opinion, uh, in some portion of teaching in medical school should be in, in person. I think at least thirty percent of teaching and learning in medical school should be in person, although. Uh, uh, it is a risk case sometimes. And I, I, I stress that it, this kind of COVID pandemic can be the teachable moment for medical students. So we understand that and we can give students to learn uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic. Thank you. If I may, I fully agree with JJ's comment. And I think uh, one of the key learning again is how do we leverage technology to further advance the teaching and learning that we want to empower our students with? And my learning so far from our students' reaction during COVID-19 is that they know exactly where they want to drive this ship. So engaging students actively so that you have student-led learning in some of this redesign of curricula is crucial. I gave you the example of the student-led activities in supporting public health and other physicians and healthcare providers. It's all initiated by the students. And it's amazing if you actually allow them and encourage them to go forward, to be well. And I think we need to really learn from that. And, and, and I think one of the new normals, going back to Daniel's original question, but echoing JJ's comment, is the activity the actual engagement of the learner in redesigning medical education. I think that is something to stay. Um, it initially started off with the question, what are students going to do when they are not on the wards in the hospital? It turned out the answers are very colorful and very meaningful and very socially responsible. So I think that part is part of the new normal. I really encourage, we have students who are very experienced in mechanical engineering, in computer science, in all kinds of things. I think they have ideas that can really stimulate us and catalyze this uh, transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Comments from other countries and institutions? Hello. Hello. Hi, this is uh, Professor Kong Hello. Hello. from CUHK. Um, just a comment, really, um, going back to your question about um, medical education. I think COVID has really, it hasn't quite made the medical profession think about how they should change their system. I mean, the, the you know, the ward rounds, um, uh, the way that um, uh, cross infection between patients, and I think that's something that um, the medical uh, community needs to start thinking about after COVID. 
And I think that if the medical community can change some of their very traditional ways, um, their medical um, their medical education can catch up. I think with the medical community doing very traditional ways of um, of uh, 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 teaching or consulting with patients, I think there is some limitations in which the medical education uh, would be able to um, expand some of those boundaries. So I think part of it is that if the medical communi um, communities in different hospitals, clinics can start thinking about doing things differently um, to prevent uh, cross-infection, um, then that might be a way ahead in which that then we can work with them to see how we can actually further that kind of the medical model for the patient. As you were saying, like with regards to telecommunication, uh, I mean, it is um, a way that we can, as we become more global and we can get sort of uh, more medical opinions and also patients probably do expect uh, uh, elements of this as they're becoming more online. But how do we make that uh, safe for the profession, uh, prof professionals? And then how do we build that up into our, um, uh, in, in the way that we teach? I think so the future really also uh, relies in sort of faculty development and also working with the profession and the services to actually forward some of that agenda as well. Yeah. Thank you. As a human, we will find a new place. So, Professor, uh, Professor Dr. Salcedo, please. Wang. 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 Sorry. Professor Rose Wang. If I may just add a comment to comments, uh, remark, totally <laughs> agree. I, I, I think uh, the challenge here for all of us as medical educators is this. How do we become that catalyst of change? How do we in the meta system become an enabler of the systemic change of the medical and health system? And you gave a very good example because we train the future practitioners. We are the pipeline of the future doctors and other health professionals. So if we train our future doctors so that they are competent with virtual care, with delivering what is best practice of teaching online, then people become the system. The system is therefore changed. So I think the challenge for all of us as leaders in medical education is that we can become that enabler to drive the change. It's going to take time. And typically, if you believe in quality improvement theory, it usually takes two to three cycles. So if you think about our crop of anywhere between, in Canada is a four year program, it's a second degree program, menopause ovation along the Pacific Rim is anywhere between five to six years. So multiply by two or three, which is about 10 to 15 years, then the systems change because you would have populated with at least three cohorts, which is not very long if you think about it this way. So it can be done. And maybe that is the, the um, challenge and the call to action for all of us as medical educators in the world. Thank you. Okay, so any other comments? Okay, so we will uh, uh, have the uh, uh, Dean, Dr. Chan Tzu, in to wrap up today's webinar. Okay, uh, that's all for today. I deeply appreciate all of you to share with us these unique experiences and also active discussion. And I especially thank Professor Wang at different time zone, uh, at this uh, midnight maybe. Uh, I, I hope the webinar today will provide opportunity for us to reflect what we have done so far and uh, also contribute to further improving our medical education in this era of new normal after COVID-19. I think it's time to adjourn now, and I hope everybody and every institution stays safe and happy. And I look forward to meeting you, hopefully next time face-to-face -face soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.